while the ushers come to receive that offering, one other thing I'd just like to, to update you on. We get the privilege as a church family of being able to celebrate that last week during our Easter services, uh, from what we know of, five different adults gave their life to Jesus and started relationship with him, started to walk in the resurrection power that he offers and new life that he offers. And we're thankful for that as a church. It's what we most celebrate and most look forward to seeing happen as God transforms and changes lives. If people recognize their need for him, uh, confess that and then receive the gift that he offers. And like I said, we got to see that happen with five adults that we know of last week and maybe uh, more as well. But we get to explore and engage in the transforming uh, work of God and his activity. And as would make sense, after you talk about new life and resurrection and grace, you should always follow it up with a list of rules. And so that's what we're going to do for 10 weeks. We're going to look at the Ten Commandments and just, just bombard ourselves with what rules look like uh, as it looks. Now we're going to engage with, uh, for 10 weeks, on what it, the, the core set of instructions that most of us remember from Scripture, that most of culture remembers from Scripture, the rules that are most clear or maybe quick off of our tongue when we think about the faith. And we're going to look at them individually over the course of the next 10 weeks. Many of us understand rules. They become a part of life at a pretty young age. It doesn't take long until you're told things like, sit down, raise your hand when you're ready to speak, be quiet, no cutting in line, keep your hands to yourself. And those are just at the start of our lives. We grow older and they change. They start to just have more things added to the list. I was a youth pastor for a while working with teenagers and one of my favorite rules, it never had to be written, it was only ever spoken. It was mainly spoken on trips and retreats we would go on. It was two words. One, one rule summed up in two words. No purple. We had this understanding in our youth group that boys were blue and girls were red or pink and that purple wasn't something that was supposed to happen. Girls weren't supposed to go into boys' rooms. Boys weren't supposed to go in girls' rooms. When we were on trips and retreats, we would simply say no purple. Kinds of rules and understandings that because of the group or organization we're part of, because of the relationships that we have, we willingly walk into. It doesn't stop as teenagers. Every job I've had has had an employee manual as a part of it. And while that explains the benefits you get with working at an organization, it also usually has some standards of behavior that are expected because you're in relationship with that organization. And so when I got employed here, I, got, I was given an employee manual that said some of the ways I'm supposed to behave and put restrictions on some of the ways that I'm supposed to behave. More descriptive than that and a, uh, a more definitive and maybe even a higher standard than that is what it looked like when I got licensed to serve as a pastor in this denomination. And the list of things they say of people who get that privilege, what it means that you're willing to commit to as a set of behaviors because you're in relationship with an organization. We understand that rules are kind of a part of life and these might be the 10 most famous rules, the Ten Commandments, something that many of us are aware of, something that our culture has at least a, an understanding of in some way. And so I'd encourage you, I'm going to say quite a bit about the Ten Commandments before we jump into the first one this morning. But as I am, just try to think through, can you name all ten of them? Just think about it. Try to test yourself and see, do I know all ten of the Ten Commandments. Try to do it without cheating and just reading them. Try to see if you know all Ten Commandments. They're found in a couple of spots in Scripture. Moses reveals them for the first time as God has talked with him on Mount Sinai. They've been freed from Egypt, the people of God have. They're out of slavery and out of bondage, and Moses has begun communicating with God about what it'll look like to live in relationship with him. And God says, I'm going to tell you all the things you need to tell the people. And he gives them actually in that time 613 different instructions, 613 different rules or commands, but 10 of them are kind of set apart as the ones we remember the most because God himself wrote them on stone tablets. In fact, not just once, but twice because the tablets got broken and he rewrote them again on another set of tablets. The first time Moses talks about it, it's to the people of God hearing it for the first time in Exodus chapter 20, but they're also recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5. 40 years later, the next generation of the people of God, Moses is talking to and he's reminding them of what God has said and of the behaviors he hopes from us as we're in relationship with him. 
And when he's doing so, there are occasionally some subtle differences. The reasoning for a command may change or the the descriptive nature in which is given behind a command may change. And throughout the next 10 weeks, as we get to each of those commandments, we'll point out those differences where they exist. But what's true is that uh, within those two places, there's a couple of different ways that people can read the commandments. A quick question for those of you who are willing to play the game. How many of you would raise your hand saying, I think I could name all 10 of them? This was this similar to the other couple of services. We had one confident hand, and we had a couple who were like, I think I could. I'll kind of give Nate the little wave thing from here, but I'm not, but don't call me up on stage to test me, but I think maybe I could get it. And a lot of people who thought either I didn't play or nope, I, I can't get all 10 of them. When I've taught these before in group settings, I've let the group try to think of all 10 together and seen people often still only come up with eight or nine of them. Similarly, I've let groups try to come up with the 12 tribes of Israel when I've taught through the Old Testament, and they get eight or nine of them. They miss more of those than they miss of the commandments. But if I ask them to name the seven dwarfs, they're going to get all of them somehow. It always takes them a while to remember Bashful or Doc, but they get all the other ones pretty quick. The the kinds of things that we remember or prioritize. What's often also interesting is if I invited all the people who raised their hand up here and asked them to tell you the Ten Commandments, they may give you different lists. Still from the same source material, they could even quote it word for word. But they may number them differently or label them differently. This has been true throughout church history. We know that there's supposed to be Ten Commandments. We'll talk about why we know that in a little bit. But people number the list very differently from each other. A list is going to come up on the screen behind me. This is the typical list that evangelical churches use. And this is what we're going to, how we're going to cover them and the order we're going to go through them over the course of the next 10 weeks. And you can see them listed there, that, that we would have no other gods but, but God, that we won't make idols, that we won't misuse God's name, that we'll remember the Sabbath and observe it and keep it holy, that we'll honor our fathers and mothers, that we won't murder, won't commit adultery, won't steal, won't lie, and won't covet. That's the typical list as an evangelical understands it. It's a different list if you ask somebody who was raised Catholic and memorized them in their upbringing what the Ten Commandments are. All the same words, but they'll change a little bit. A Catholic understanding of the Ten Commandments would combine Commandment 1 and 2 as they are on the screen, that having no other gods before me and not making idols or graven images would all be one command, and everything else would shift up a spot. So number two would be not using the name in vain. Number three would not be, or would be the observing the Sabbath. Until you get to number nine there, which is listed as not to covet. In the Catholic and many Lutheran churches, not to covet gets divided into two. It's don't covet the wife and don't covet their things. And that's because if you read them in Exodus and Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy it gets more specific. Deuteronomy says not just to not cover the house or the wife, but gets far more specific about the other things to not covet. Early church father named Augustine, when he was listing the Ten Commandments, listed them, prioritizing them based on what Deuteronomy said. And so he combined numbers one and two and divided number ten, as we see it on the screen, into two. Whereas the church father Origen, who most of the Protestants follow his list, uh, prioritized Exodus's recording. And it's a little more simple and less specific in some of its reasoning and explanations. And so his list is the, the one you see on the screen. For those of you who are like history nerds or religious nerds, the, the Jewish faith is even different. They still have 10, but it's different than either of those lists. They, they use what we call the precursor. Where right before the Ten Commandments, God says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And they call that the first commandment or the first instruction God gave. That we'd recognize he is our God, commandment one. That we'd have no other gods before beside him and not make images all together. Again, combining those, commandment two, and then the rest of the list as we have it. Three different lists. All of them, though, come back to having ten. They do so because of verses like Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 4, that say, Moses is retelling the story of God having to make second tablets again. And he says, the Lord wrote on these tablets what he had written before, the Ten Commandments he had proclaimed to you on the mountain 
out of the fire on the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them to me. Moses clearly states the stones that God wrote on by himself. He wrote 10 instructions, 10 commands, 10 rules. That part were clear. There's supposed to be 10. But if you read through the wording of the 10 commandments, you'll find 20 or 30 different commands that are listed in there. Just by way of example, if you read about the Sabbath, it would say something like, observe the Sabbath. That's a command. Make it holy. Did I just lose? Oh, it's back. Make it holy is a command. Don't do any work. Another command. Don't let your animals do work. Don't let your servants do work. There's at least seven commands listed in the Sabbath commandment itself. And Scripture by nowhere says, well, this is the first one, and this is the second one, and this is the third one. We just know there's supposed to be ten. And how people divide the list has changed throughout church history. Whatever the list you hold to, we'll put the one back on the screen that we're going to use. We often look at it and we say that's kind of the pinnacle of who we're supposed to be. Like that's the the epitome, the high bar of what living looks like. And we like to say that. We like to say that because most of us have failed. And if it was a low bar, we wouldn't want to have to admit we couldn't reach a low bar. So most of us say, that's the, that's the pinnacle. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to uphold these commandments. And if I'm honest and I look at them, I've broken some of these. If you're honest and you look at them, you've likely broken some of them as well. And so while we often set them up as a high bar that we're supposed to reach, I actually like a different pastor's definition better that would say, when it comes down to it, this is the basic understanding of what it means to be human. This is the bar that separates us from the animals. This is the lowest level of what we should be able to accomplish. As we were made in God's image, uniquely spiritual and physical at the same time, God says, here's some instructions on what that spiritual life is supposed to look like. And here's some instructions on what that physical life is supposed to look like. It sets you apart from every other thing I've created. So you need to be, out of all the things that I've created, could you guys be the ones that don't kill each other? And yet we've failed. (laughs) We often fail at reaching what should be the basic minimum standard of being a human. We often act again on our own animal-like instincts. We, like I said, have most likely all failed at the ones listed on the screen, and yet we've definitively all failed when we look at what Jesus says about them as he begins to make them more poignant and a little harder in some cases. Not just don't commit murder, but don't even hate people. Not just don't commit adultery, but don't even have lust in your heart. And we recognize that all of us have fallen short of these instructions given to us by God on what it looks like to be in covenant relationship with him. And yet while that's true, Well, it's true in faith that it's a priority of ours and that we often fail at it. It's not just something that religious people pay attention to. In America, the culture around us understands some things about the Ten Commandments, understands that there's a thing called the Ten Commandments often, and that generally has an opinion about them. In fact, it's so known that this is something people that don't even believe in God understand, that it is more present in our culture than almost any other aspect of faith, at least in some areas. I'll give an example. If you look in history of the court cases that have taken place in relationship to our faith, you will find more court cases about the Ten Commandments than any other part of our faith. I'm not saying you'll find more court cases about murder or about adultery or about stealing. I'm saying about the Ten Commandments, about this list and where it can be posted and where it can't be posted. And should it be in schools or not in schools? And can it be in courthouses or not in courthouses? It can be on government property or in state parks. There are more court cases about the Ten Commandments than there are about homosexual marriage. There have been more court cases in history about the Ten Commandments than there have been about abortion. It's been consuming of what's legal or illegal about this list of rules than any other thing in our faith. It's culturally represented almost every year in court cases around our country. Comically so, in a way, 
that those same courts debate if you're allowed to post the Ten Commandments in the place that they ask you to rest your hand upon a Bible to show that you're not lying when you give testimony. The Ten Commandments are something that we're aware of because of the expectation they set. They set an expectation of what it looks like to be in a covenant relationship with God. And our culture says, I don't want you to have to tell me about a covenant relationship with God. I don't want to know anything about what you believe about God. Just remove those kinds of things from everything I interact with. They set the expectation of our covenant relationship with God. And the first commandment, the one we'll look at the rest of this morning, sets that expectation the clearest. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Word for word identical in the Exodus and Deuteronomy accounts. Moses doesn't change that one at all as he records them for us. The first command as we understand it, to have no other gods before him. It makes sense to us as we see that, that it looks again like the easiest of them. We've grown up in a culture that doesn't often believe in a multitude of gods. We don't have a lot of other deities we're asked to go and worship or sacrifice to or give offerings toward. And so we see like, oh yeah, I get when Moses was writing them that they worshiped like the sun god Ra in Egypt. And so when he's saying you can't worship those gods anymore, that you're only supposed to worship me, that makes sense that we wouldn't have any other gods before or beside me. But that's not really the core of what Moses is trying to say or what God's trying to say at that moment. The Ten Commandments are not a place where God is trying to prove he's the only true God. Scripture will prove that in a number of other places, and it will make that argument clear that there is only one true God. But the Ten Commandments are about what we prioritize and how we prioritize it. Talking to a group of people who worshiped a multitude of deities, God says, I have to be the priority. It can't be me alongside the rest of your other gods. It has to be me and me alone. And where we have the temptation to say, well, I can check that one off the list as one as I've always obeyed. We have to ask ourselves the question, have we really prioritized God the way he's asked us to? Because we might not label them as deities, but we often give our lives to the same things those deities represent. Ra, the sun god in Egypt, uh, we may not name as a deity and worship, but many of us are longing for the fact and bemoaning the fact and orientating our life around the fact that the sun has not shown up here in April the way we expect it to. I went on a run yesterday and my water literally froze. That is not supposed to happen when I'm running in April. And while we might not label that deity and we might not offer sacrifices or worship, many of us have oriented our lives around what the environment around us is doing. And we've placed that on equal terms with what the activity of the God that we love and serve around us is. Or in that time, people would have gods that were often uh, gods of the harvest, the God that you would hope to send rain so you could grow the crops and provide for your family. And while we may not all be agrarian anymore, we all still long for, not by name of deity, but gainful employment that provides for our family. And we orientate our lives around and we mix our work life into our spiritual life in a way that puts it on par with God, saying, well, well, I just need to get... I need to get the environment around me, and I need to get my job figured out, and and alongside of that, I want God too. Or they would name the God of fertility. And so when they were longing to start a family, or when they were longing to see their kids behave, or when they were longing to see their family unified and grow well, they had a specific deity they prayed to. And while we may not have the deity by name any different than God, many of us have prioritized our families alongside or sometimes even above the God in our life. What God is saying is, I want to be in right relationship with you, and for that to happen, you have to prioritize me. This has to be what you get right. And what I would guess is true for many of us, and what I think is observable in the world around us, is that we don't. 
That if I asked a question of a group of 20 to 25 year olds, what's the thing you most feel like you need to get right? They would say, if I can figure out dating and find the spouse for me, if I can get that part right, then the rest of life will take care of itself. That's the building block I have to get in place first. If you fast forward them a couple of years and they get a little bit older, and you ask somebody in their late 20s, it's, if I can get my job right, if I can find the right kind of employer or employment, and I can make the kind of money I need, if I can get that figured out, uh, everything else that goes on in my life will be easy to take care of. I'll have the resources to manage everything I need, and life will go the way I want. And fast forward a couple of years for others, and it may be, if I can get my family started, or if I can get my kids to behave and listen, or if I can get my spouse to behave and listen, if we can figure out how to do family together, then that if we can get that right, everything else will flow out of what we're trying to do and it will all go well. And alongside that, yes, I believe in God. He's just not the priority. He's not the first building block. He's just one that's on the list somewhere. What God says even later in the commandments and throughout scripture is that he wants all of us and that he's jealous. God notices every time we prioritize something else Or every time we place something on equal footing as God in our lives, every time our focus shifts towards those things in place of prioritizing God, he notices and he's jealous and we have broken the covenant of what it looks like to live in relationship with him. So the hope is that because of the response of the relationship we want to have in God, we would almost flip a switch on what our priorities are. This is something we see in the world around us. This is something many of us have done. Maybe the most clear way this happens is in marriage. And when I'm talking with couples that are getting ready to get married, I talk about some of the differences of what life looked like while they were single or dating or engaged and what those differences will be like when they're married. And some of those are things you learn over time and some of those things that adjust slowly. But occasionally there's things within a marriage that shift the moment you say, I do. There's an instantaneous expectation change in what your life looks like. Here's the example I commonly give. Through our single life, our dating life, and our engaged life, we focused most of our time conversations about scheduling time with the other person. Hey, are you available for dinner tomorrow night? Let's schedule some time together. And that's the pattern of our life with our relationships, with even the people who are most important to us. We schedule time with them. And then we get married. And when you get married, you switch almost instantaneous without even having to speak it to each other from scheduling time with each other to start scheduling the time that's apart from each other. It turns from, do you want to have dinner tomorrow night when you're dating to some of my friends want to know if I can have dinner with them tomorrow night. I'm scheduling my time away from my wife or away from my family. There's this instantaneous switch on the way you adjust your own schedule because of what you understand about the new covenant priority in your life. And in a marriage, the new covenant priority is that your spouse and your family is number one. And you schedule the other things as an afterthought to the priority. That's what God is saying. God's saying, when you want to be in relationship with me, there's a priority change and I become the number one priority. You don't look at jobs and family and uh, spouses and dating and relationships and then have me scheduled alongside as the thing you do on Sunday mornings and occasionally when you read the Bible and pray. No, when you're in right relationship and covenant relationship with God, he is the priority. And you still do job and you do it well, and the scripture will talk about that. And you still do family and you do it well, but you do that as an outflow of your relationship with God, not as an equal priority alongside him. That's what God says. You would have no other gods before me that you're the one. He's your one focus. That's what it means to be in right covenant relationship with God. A simple question of evaluation for yourself. Are you in right relationship with God? Have you prioritized him above everything else? Or is he just on the list of things that are important to you? Or worse yet, 
Is he behind some of the other things that are important to you? You shall have no other gods before me. You should have no other gods beside me. I should be the priority if this covenant relationship will go well. God had rescued his people. He had freed them. He had delivered them. He had guided them to where he needed to go. He had come to be with them and then says the next step belongs to God's people. And to remain in his presence, to respond to what he's offering, it starts by prioritizing him. Throughout scripture, there is no fear consistently listed that we would turn our back on the one true God to start worshiping a false God. We may assume that the scripture's warnings are that we would turn away from Christianity and towards Islam or away from Christianity and towards Buddhism, but by and large, the scripture does not seem to be concerned that we would turn away from the true God and towards a false God. What Scripture continuously warns about, what the prophets warn about, what Jesus warns about, even what Satan's own tactics are in our life isn't to turn us away from the true God and towards a false one. It's to turn us to be people who combine things with our worship of God. Scripture's constant warning is you can't worship God and money. You can't worship God and your provision. You can't worship God and your family. You can't prioritize God and your kids. You can't have the and thing. You can have a job. You can have kids. You can have a family. Scripture wants a lot of those things for us and tells us how to do them well, but there has to be a priority, not an equal nature. God isn't just the afterthought. He's not just secondary on the list. He's not just the token that we go to when it will be valuable, that we live life our way and then ask God for help when it's not going our way. No, it says God has to be the priority. And Scripture continuously warns us that when we're going to mess this up, it's not going to be because we start worshiping some other God. It's going to be because we start to add things into our life that we think have an equal importance or sometimes more importance than God. That's the consistent fear. That's the consistent warning that comes. Do all of the good things, but do them as an outflow of an appropriate covenant relationship with God, not as the priority of life. God wants the entire style of our life to be prioritized with relationship with him. Every action we take every thought we have, all of our emotions to be from the prioritization of God in our lives. And that we would be willing to change lots about us and lots about what we want because we prioritize God in our lives. We see this in other instances. We see at times of life that we're willing to change our behaviors because of the covenant relationships we're in, or we're willing to address or uh, adjust how we behave uh, because of who we belong to and because of what our priority is. So I'll give an example. When I was a freshman in college, I moved in a few weeks early to start uh, training with the soccer team as a student athlete. And uh, throughout that time, I, I spent the first couple of weeks just getting to know all the other soccer players before all the other students moved in. And then freshman move-in week came and a bunch of other people started moving into the school and I started to get to know some of them and do activities with them that weren't just with the soccer team. And I can remember during the first week of school on the college campus for me, uh, there was a group of people who wanted to go rollerblading. And so I grabbed my rollerblades and we went around downtown Minneapolis on the sidewalks and streets and down through some of the walking bridges and we just went rollerblading down some steep hills all of the kinds of fun things that we would do as 18 year olds rollerblading around downtown Minneapolis and I remember as I came back to campus rollerblading with a group of people I was on Elliott Avenue I can picture where I was when I looked towards the lobby and I saw somebody I knew running out of the lobby his name was Brent Brent was a junior at the time and he was on the soccer team so I had known him a couple of weeks and Brent came running out, and as loud as he could yell, he just said, Nate, what are you doing? Well, I don't know if you've ever seen these things before. They've been here for like 15 years. They're rollerblades, inline skates. I've been doing that. I think it's pretty obvious what I'm doing. Don't you know you're not allowed to do that? I 
never heard of a rule in downtown Minneapolis that you can't rollerblade. I don't think it's illegal here. I know it's not part of a school rule that I'm not allowed to rollerblade. Probably not in the hallways or something, but I'm outside. I think I'm okay. And he goes, no, don't you know that because you're on the soccer team, you can't do that. So what do you mean? He goes, and when your floor in a couple of weeks starts intramural football, you can't play. And when the gym is open and people are playing pickup basketball, you can't play. At least not until November when the soccer season is done. Because as a team, we commit to not doing anything physical that might get us hurt during the soccer season. Because it's not just about you. Like if you get hurt and don't get to play, yes, that affects you. But that affects our whole team. And we committed to some health things as well. We didn't drink soda for the three months of soccer season. That meant every August, I went through caffeine withdrawals. Because for nine months a year, I was addicted to soda. But we committed. I hadn't had that explained to me before, but Brent was letting me know. He was letting me know while yelling at me the act of service he was doing for me. Because he said, you're lucky that I found you. And that it wasn't a coach or a captain. Because if it's a coach or a captain that sees you doing this, you will not appreciate practice the next day. The kinds of exercise you'll be allowed to do or forced to do will not be fun for you. There will be punishment that will come with putting your body at risk because you haven't prioritized the soccer team enough. The soccer team can't just be the thing you also do for three months. It needs to be a priority to the point where you won't go rollerblade with your friends or play intramural football or go to open gym. The next day I went to practice and I asked the captains, hey, are we supposed to not do some of those kinds of things? Yeah. If we catch you doing those kinds of things, there's going to be more push-ups and sit-ups and laps than you would ever want to do. The coach affirmed again when intramural football was starting, He made sure to let us all know, you're not supposed to play. We don't want you to get hurt. That because of what we prioritize, we're willing to adjust all of the ways we think about other, even good behaviors. God's saying, because of the covenant and the relationship I want to have with you, prioritize me above everything else. And even those good things like families and children and spouses and jobs, all of the kinds of things we often prioritize, he says, do all of those as an outflow of your relationship with me. But I should be a priority that influences every action and every thought and every emotion. That's the first commandment. And it's not just the first in a list. It's not just an arbitrary one of the equal ten. It's the most important one. I'll say it this way. If you can get this one right, if you can prioritize God and your relationship with him above all other things and let everything else flow out of that, the rest of the nine of them are going to be easy. They'd be simple. If you appropriately prioritize God and put nothing beside him or before him, all of the other commands will be easy. All of the other instructions for what it looks like to live as his person or people would be easy. It's not one of many. It's not just the start of the list. It's the most important one. In Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus is asked the question, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. There's no sense in which if we can just figure out how to not lie, that somehow everything else will work out. If we can just figure out how to not steal, that somehow everything else will work out. But the most important thing for us to get right, Scripture says, Jesus himself says, is loving God with everything we are, prioritizing him above everything else. Simple set of three questions for you. Are you loving God with all of your heart or just part of it? Are you loving God with all of your soul or just part of it? 
Are you loving God with all of your mind or with just part of it? Because if it's about doing life your way and just adding God on the side, he says, that's not what covenant relationship looks like. And I get jealous and I get angry and I don't necessarily stay in presence with you. But if you want to respond to the gift of life and the freedom and the grace and the leadership and him coming to be with us, he starts that list by saying, prioritize him above all else. Is God your priority. My hope throughout the weeks is that you may in advance read through some of the commandments and try to figure out how they apply in our culture, in our lives, but also that you'll reflect on what they look like in your own heart. And so I'd encourage you throughout this week to reflect on this commandment, the verses in Deuteronomy and Exodus that just say we need to prioritize God and have no other gods before him and ask yourself, ask God to reveal to you Anything else you've put alongside him, anything you've put as equal priority or as a higher priority than him. And as he does so, just confess that, just reveal that, just be made aware of it and admit that that's different from what he hopes for you. Ask him for forgiveness and then ask him by the power of his spirit who works within you to help you flip that switch. To flip that switch from God being a part of a priority, somebody you only schedule time with when it's convenient, to God being the default understanding of your life that all other things are evaluated through. Ask God to transform your heart in a way that he's the priority of all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Because if you can get that right, if we can get that right, the rest of it will be easy. It'll be a cakewalk. I'm going to pray that that would be true for us. And that God would in his grace reveal that to us. And that we would in our obedience through his power be able to live those kinds of life. Would you pray with me that that would be true? God, we're thankful. We're thankful that you chose a people, that you set them apart, that you freed them, that you hear our cries and that you respond to them, that you work on our behalf and that you lead us and that you guide us and then that you clarify for us what it looks like for us to respond, what the covenant relationship looks like. And so I pray that we would be aware of how important it is that we prioritize you above all else and that we would do that well. In an aim to do that, I ask that you'd reveal to us any ways that we've prioritized something above you or put you alongside another list of things that we long to see go well. That you'd reveal that to us and transform our hearts in a way that rightly prioritize you and allow all of those other things to be pursuit that are an outflow of our relationship with you, not the focus of our lives. We pray that because your spirit works in us that we'd be able to do that and that we get to see and celebrate that wonderful relationship with you as we align ourselves with your instructions and your hopes for our lives. Help us to do that and to do that well, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, over the course of the next nine weeks as a church together, we'll look at the, the nine remaining commands and how they interact with our lives and our faith and how they interact with our culture and the world around us, hoping that we can be people who live appropriately in covenant relationship with God. As you go today, go with grace and peace and with God as the priority above all other things. You are dismissed.